Hi everyone, it's David from Automotive Press. You guys already know I love Mazda CX-70 and CX-90 series, but you might not know exactly why. Well, I'm going to explain to you exactly what's going on with the CX-70 and 90, including some controversial discussion about the timing chain in the engine compartment. So I'll address that a little bit later on. But for now, what I want to say is that based on my years of experience working as an automotive engineer, this thing is the best engineered and best built vehicle for the price. I'm not saying that just based on some simple check and audit. I'm saying that based on some deep knowledge, talking to engineers, and also visiting the actual factory that is building the CX-70 and 90, which is in Japan, which is a Hofu plant, um, roughly about an hour south of Hiroshima. And this thing is built like a tank, it's engineered like a tank, and I'm going to show you exactly why. Let's go. Welcome back. So why do I think the Mazda CX-70 and the 90, which are very similar to each other, are some of the best engineered vehicle in the world? Well, I'm going to show you a few things. Now, I have spoken a number of times about some engineering behind the scenes for CX-70 and CX-90, but I'm going to reiterate some of those things again and also kind of do a double check on the quality in terms of exterior because you're going to be shocked in terms of what I can show you because it's actually 2.9 millimeter and even down to 2.8 millimeter here. And the fact that they can actually engineer this particular panel this way, so you'll see a kind of double curve here. This is actually really difficult to stamp in the stamping shop, but even more difficult to weld the pieces together to create this kind of curvature. And even with that, it's still less than three millimeter. And I can tell you right now, based on measuring the gaps for almost every car that's sold in the world, no one can hit below three millimeter except for maybe just one or two companies including lexus but even lexus is usually three to four millimeters and not less than three millimeters so that's itself it's actually quite an accomplishment and same thing here is 2.9 maybe even down to 2.8 millimeter and back to 2.9 millimeter with a very consistent gap from top all the way to bottom Again, in such a huge panel that's very difficult to achieve. Uh, you might not appreciate it if you don't understand manufacturing, but I was an automotive manufacturing engineer for many, many years, still involved in that field. And I can tell you how difficult it is to do that. And even here, which is very difficult to do in terms of lining up the fuel cap to the rest of the body, you can see from the angle. I know car is dirty right now, but it's a perfect fit and nothing is sticking out. And even in some of the latest Toyota and Lexus models, sometimes the fuel cap sticks out a little bit, not with Mazda. And if you look at all the plastic pieces, these kind of plastic panels, the finishing of the glossy black pieces, the chrome trims, the composite materials in terms of bumper and the paint matching, again, unheard of in terms of pure quality. I would rank this in the top five cars in the world, maybe even top three. And the paint job too, very little orange peel, unlike many Japanese cars that seems to suffer from that. The paint is very consistent and I know the car is dirty again right now, but I've been looking at the CX-70 and 90 for a long time and the paint job is just second to none. And part of that is because they hammered the metal pieces here across the board to create that zebra effect that I talked about many times in the past, which is to engineer the reflection in such a way that the line actually creates kind of zebra look, like lines like this. It comes through here and then reflects back again here. A bit hard to see right now, but this kind of zebra effect is not something you see in any other products in the world. Honestly, no one else has bothered to create a zebra effect by engineering a panel and reflection as a result to create the feel. So that's another incredible engineering accomplishment. And then I'm going to now uh, just open the hood right now and talk a little bit about the engine as well and the layout of CX-70 and CX-90s architecture because that's also very important. So I've got the um, engine compartment open right now and you can tell that this thing has a clever a hanging system here as well. But the most important things that people need to realize is that the CX-70 and CX-90 is what we call rear wheel drive bias, which means that essentially it's designed to be a rear wheel drive vehicle, but with power applied to the front wheels to make it into all wheel drive. 
and that means that it also has a um, longitudinal inline six cylinder engine and that is very much a characteristic of other high performance vehicles such as BMWs. They often use inline six engine, they're famous for that and their layout is very similar to the Mazda CX-70, CX-90 because they are also rear wheel drive biased. And that isn't the case for most other competitors. In fact, 99% of competitors really have front wheel drive biased. It's designed to be a front wheel drive car and then they uh, provide additional mechanism for the rear to provide all wheel drive. So for example, the Toyota Grand Highlander or the corresponding Lexus TX, Nissan Pathfinder, Honda Pilot, Honda Passport, Acura MDX, you can keep on naming it, and they all have front wheel drive biased chassis and design. And also many of them have turbo four now, and in some cases like Honda, they still have a six cylinder engine, but no one has inline six cylinder engine. And the reason why that is so critical for providing ultimate performance is the fact that the feel of the engine is very different from a normal V6 engine. And also the chassis feels different when you're driving through curvy roads and mountainous roads because the torque split is more biased toward the rear and that gives you the maximum handling and the feel very much reminiscent of uh, well-designed BMWs. And so that means that the actual layout and design of the CX-70 and CX-90 is fundamentally different from pretty well every other three-row SUVs or two-row SUVs. And that is a huge accomplishment from my perspective because really no other brands is trying to do that right now other than again like BMW and some of the European models. So for a Japanese manufacturer to create a three row SUV with this layout in terms of rear wheel drive bias and inline six and also this design, it's just an incredible feat because I think this is the best way to provide maximum performance. Now that does bring some other questions. So for example, why is it inline six and not V6? Well, as I mentioned, the inline six has a very different feel and a different characteristic. It provides a very smooth acceleration, but also really gutsy, torquey feel at lower RPM. This is turbocharged, by the way, with a mild hybrid, so that also helps with the torque. Uh, but when you drive it, it, the actual feeling of the steering in terms of the handling, in terms of feedback from the road, is different because there's more torque applied to rear wheels than they are applied to the front wheels. And that basically means that there's a huge difference in terms of layout and the architecture of this Mazda CX-70 90 series. And now I will talk about this very brief things because this comes up every time I talk about these models. And that is about the timing chain. And you guys know that I'm a good friend with Ahmed from Car Care Nut. He is the best mechanic in the world and his advice is absolutely gold. And he and I'm really good friends and we talk often. Um, but I know that he also uh, criticized the Mazda CX-70, CX-90 because of the timing chain, which is located in the back of this engine. You can't really see it right now. And that if you ever have to change it, it's a real problem. And uh, he mentioned that it is not a best design. So I agree with that, but I have also mentioned to him that uh, you know the timing chain is not supposed to be changed at all. In fact, it's supposed to be lifetime. It could be 200, 250,000 miles, or even longer. And the only time you ever have to change it is if the timing chain is defective or there's something wrong with it, then you may have to deal with it. But until such time, it's supposed to actually stay intact with the car for the rest of the life, even upwards of 200,000 miles or more. I mean, you know, if you have to drive this car up to 300, 400, 500,000 miles, that's a different story. I don't know if the timing chain would last that long. So at some point that could be an issue. But the second thing I also want to point out is that if you do have to deal with the timing chain, removing this engine is not as big of a deal as most people think because Mazda engineers have already taken that into account. Removing engine is not like in old days that requires many, many hours. It's not that difficult anymore. It's not simple, but it's not difficult also. You can remove the bumper and the front end, uh, which is pretty quick and that gets removed. And you can actually slide the engine forward and then pull it right out. And you know, it could be 45 minutes and an hour to maybe do that because it's designed to allow for the serviceability. So even though it's a very compact design, it's a lot of stuff happening in the engine compartment and certainly having timing chain in the back isn't ideal. I actually don't think it's a, an actual issue because you don't have to replace the timing chain. Again, it's supposed to be lifetime. And if you do have to replace it, well, it can be done without too much difficulty. And also keep in mind again that they're basically kind of copying or replicating what BMW does. So they also have a timing chain in the back. 
and so do many other brands. So I think it only will become an issue if it proves to be unreliable and timing chain has to be dealt with. Otherwise, you leave the sleeping giant alone and it's not an issue. So I wouldn't worry about that right now. And also in terms of the whole engine being complicated and difficult to work with, again, I agree with that. But so do most of the other competitors' engine compartment now. If you look at the Land Cruiser's 2.4 liter turbocharged hybrid, it's immensely complicated. And so I don't think they're a simple design anymore these days. And I don't think the Mazda is any worse than really any other modern cars I've seen. So that's my kind of comment in terms of engine compartment. But just once again, the inline six cylinder engine, 3.3 liters, is one of the best engines in the world in terms of feel, in terms of torque output power delivery, and just a general feel, this inline six is a real gem. Now let me go back in inside and tell you a little bit more about what I see inside that makes this car a truly a world class as well. Okay, I'm inside the Mazda CX-90 now, and I'm going to carry on discussing why I'm convinced that this may be one of the best engineered SUV in the world, especially for this price and especially in this category. One of the things is that uh, Mazda have chosen to pick their materials very carefully. So if you guys uh, recall, many of the Toyota cars I've been reviewing are showing um, very cheap materials, hard plastic on the door, hard plastic on the dash, and also you know, kind of cheap plastic overall. That's been the trend for Toyota and even some Lexus models, and I haven't been very happy about that. Of course, they're well built and everything, but they could have easily upgraded the materials to something like this. So right here, we have a Mazda 6 1790 which are not premium cars in terms of brand but look i have a soft plastic here so this is not hard plastic we have a beautiful uh, aluminum look finish here with bronze accent leather stitching on the door which is rare most car companies don't bother putting stitching on the door handle itself and then soft plastic here look at it. i can literally sink my thumb in here soft plastic here nicely covered cloth here so it's not cheap plastic as well and leather type materials all the way to the dash with more stitching here more stitching here and then they were clever enough not to pick glossy black for this part here as well so this is kind of like a cross hash design so you don't show any kind of scratches you don't show fingerprints and there's almost no glossy black trim in fact i really can't see any there's a little bit on the steering wheel but actually it's mostly matte black not glossy black and you only get hard plastic all the way down here and even then it's actually nicely textured and doesn't look cheap. So obviously you get a little bit of hard plastic down here. And I don't know why a Toyota and actually many other brands cannot do that anymore while they're actually doing it to, for cost reduction reasons. But Mazda have chosen not to cut corners, even though this is not an expensive vehicle, it's a very affordable three-row SUV, and yet they have all these high-end engineered materials behind the scene. You can even see the uh, kind of matte uh, semi-chrome finish here. And even up here, you have a really good tactile feel when you open these things, it doesn't feel cheap. And all the materials, including the roof lining, looks absolutely fantastic. So again, if I were to just look at the interior and not know that this is a Mazda CX-90, then I would say that this looks like an interior of um, a car costing twice as much. Well, in fact, for that matter, even if a car costs twice as much, some brands cannot replicate this level of quality and this level of material selection. So I think it's really well designed. Now let me take you for a quick drive to show you why I'm convinced the thing is the best engineered SUV. Okay, so now I'm on the road with the CX-90 and I know I've done a review on this car a couple of times already, but this time I had this car for almost two weeks and I was reminded that this could be closest thing to a perfect large three-row SUV or two-row SUV in the case of CX-70 because the handling and the feel of the engine is honestly near perfect. Now, why do I say that? Well, this past weekend, I was uh, reviewing some Porsche Cayenne 2025s, and I drove four or five different variations of the Porsche Cayenne, which would be benchmarked in the premium SUV market. And this thing comes really close in terms of the steering feel, the feedback from the road, the ability to manage corners, just the general handling feel is pretty close to Porsche Cayenne. In fact, I would say it is the closest to Porsche Cayenne than any other SUV I know in this price range, or even if you were to go up in a higher price range, there's nothing that comes close because all the other manufacturers have abandoned the idea of creating an engaging vehicle with a real dynamics, real, real character. 
And this is only possible because master engineers took the time to design this layout of a rear-wheel drive biased engineering together with a beautiful inline six-cylinder engine that's turbocharged with a mild hybrid. And the combination of that produces immense amount of power and torque. But more than that, the delivery of power and torque is smooth, is predictable, balanced. And for the first time in a large SUV, I actually have an actual feedback on my steering. This is not super light. There's enough heft to it. I can feel the road. And when I turn left and right quickly like this, the actual characteristic of a steering is second to none. It's the best in this market very close to Porsche Cayenne, which will be the benchmark from my perspective. And again, if you were to compare to some other expensive SUVs like um, Acura MDX Type S, which would be the closest high performance SUV I can think of, this one has a better steering characteristic and substantially cheaper as much as twenty to $30,000 than MDX Type S. And that car is amazing and beautiful as well. And that would be another contender in terms of high performance SUVs. But in terms of natural characteristic and the natural feeling and organic feeling that I really like, this is the best one. And you know what? In fact, it's better than some of the BMWs and Audis and Mercedes that cost twice as much. Honestly, I think this may be the most affordable option for those people who want to buy a high performance vehicle and don't want to pay the Porsche Cayenne pricing. So engine, powertrain, steering feel, even the ride, near perfect. I can't think of any other vehicle that comes close to it and therefore I'm voting this Mazda CX-90 and its closest cousin the CX-70 the best engineered and best built SUV in the world for the price. In fact even if you go up to the price bracket twice as much as the CX-70 or CX-90 this thing still handles better and overall it's better than anything else out there. So. I hope you liked my video. I know I'm giving a lot of praise to 670 and 90 because it's well deserved. I would give it a car of the year award if I can. I don't usually do that, but if I were to give that prize right now, this would be the one. And uh, yeah, it's just beautiful inside and out. Well engineered and well built. And I hope one day you have a chance to own it and drive it because you'll be convinced as I have been convinced for a long time. If you enjoyed my video, please give me a thumbs up and make some comments. And if you haven't done so yet, would you kindly subscribe as well. Until next video, I'm signing off for now. Thank you so much.